Hey everyone, so you just got a brand new Savage World setting. Um, maybe it's a third party, maybe it's a pinnacle, it doesn't matter. You're really excited to run it. So what do you do to get ready? Well, I don't know what you do, but I'm going to talk about what I do to get ready. It's a Savage World, strange as a weird world. It's a Savage World. Hey everyone, it's Carl with Tabletop Tango. Look at the bubbles, do the stuff, love your support. Um, the more Savage World stuff we can buy with support would be great. Um, so check out the website. And we also have a new podcast called Mastering the RPG, which you could check out as well. So anyway, what do I want to talk about today? So what I want to talk about is getting ready for a new setting. So it could be a pinnacle setting, you know, like Deadlands or Deadlands Lost Colony or something like that. Or it could be a third party like Wise Guys or The After or just a number of them that are out there. So what do you do to get ready? Well, I'm going to talk about what I do to get ready and it might make sense for you or you may have better ideas and that's where the comments come in. Throw them in there so we all can learn together and all be better game masters. So. What do I do? So the first things I do is I read the setting, as everybody does, um, and I start looking for kind of the key elements um, that what makes the setting have the flavor it has. Sometimes there's a lot of lore, and not all the lore is what's important for the feeling, because I'm more about the feeling of the setting. The reason I'm picking a setting is because it gives me a flavor, it gives me a feel. It's not as much the mechanics, the mechanics should drive the feeling of the setting. And so that's important. And reading it that first time and then trying to start pick out the fundamental elements that are what give that feel is kind of what I should do. Um, now, when I did my Deadlands Lost Colony, I didn't do that. And it was a mistake. Um, I read the lore. I said, hey, this is great. It's Deadlands. It's awesome. And then I turned the players loose, let them read the lore. And before you knew it, I was locked in into sort of what existed, what was codified. It took away a lot of the maneuvering room I had. So if I wasn't playing the plot point campaign, a lot of the background story was already told. Um, but so I, I don't want to do that anymore. So I, so the bottom line is I read it once and then I start picking out the key elements of what makes the flavor. So like for, uh, Dre for Deadlands Lost Colony, I spent a lot of time worrying about, well, there's the Hellstrom Industries and, you know, Hellstrom himself did this thing. And well, when the key thing is understanding the Anuks, who are the, the indigenous people of the planet, how they think, um, what they've done with the colonists, how the colonists have interacted with them, and the fact that there was a storm and the storm really drove them back kind of more into the Stone Ages. Those are the key things. And you notice none of them had anything to do with the flavor that came along with all the text about here's how the adventure and here's the history of the world. None of that came, came from that. So um, bottom line is I think the first thing to do is start looking for those key elements that drive flavor. Um, the second thing is think about what the players really need to play the game or be part of the setting. Um, so what is the, what's the scope of who they are? Um, you know, what kind of characters are you going to allow to be part of it? Again, another mistake I made with Deadlands Lost Colony is the player said, hey, this is Deadlands. Can I use my favorite, uh, you know, huckster from Deadlands? And I was like, well, it's part of the lore. It should be somewhere in there. Sure. Why not? But if I really would have understood what the setting is trying to accomplish, I would have probably steered them more towards some of the um, arcane backgrounds that were part of the setting, um, make that more who they were, as opposed to sort of bring the, the old Deadlands, which is, it's cool. It, by the way, it was a ton of fun. And the Huckster in, uh, in the Lost Colony in the future actually was kind of cool. I, you know, I'm not going to lie. It was cool. It was a lot of fun. But in the end of the day, I might not have done that normally if I had really thought about the, the setting and, and how it was set up. So um, look at the skills that are there as part of the setting. Um, a lot of settings have their own skills or they twist skills or they tweak, twist, tweak skills. And, you know, like, for example, um, in uh, the, um, the secret files of section D, they have uh, taken away the hacking skill and put in cryptography because that for this World War II flavor of um, super secret missions, cryptography was much more important. There was obviously wasn't a lot of hacking going on. Um, and so that that change in skills is something you want to look at. But you may also want to then um, curate 
the skills that are also in the game based on that flavor because some of them may not make sense or you may want to define what they mean. So uh, when somebody talks about having academics or someone talks about science as skills, they still may be important to your setting, but they may mean something different. And you should think about that up front. So when the characters are creating characters, they understand what your expectations are. Um, I do mostly homebrew. So one of my homebrew, I'll use this example, even though we're talking about um, published settings. Uh, one of my homebrews, the people were um, kind of came from, come from a Victorian age, but there's super technology out there from a previous age that the players are just now discovering. And one of the players wanted to have a hacking skill. And I didn't really, and it was like, yeah, you know, there's going to be technology. That's okay. Even in the Victorian, there's the concept of, you know, maybe you can be picking locks and that would be part. But we didn't have the conversation. I really didn't set that out as to what hacking would mean in a Victorian age game. I was too busy thinking about, uh, well, the setting has technology. It has high technology. Well, when he encountered that, now he wants to hack something he's never seen before. Think about that with your setting. Um the setting designers may have thought about the broader world, but you want to make sure you're narrowing it and you're understanding what's going to happen in your part of uh, the game that you're creating, um, especially if you're not using their plot point campaign that comes with the adventure. You're doing something your own unique. You need to make sure it's flavored. Um, another big thing that I think I forget about a lot because I kind of just let the players do what they want, but looking at the edges and hindrances, some settings they reskin existing hindrances. They kind of reskin existing edges. Um, call them something a little different. Some have great edges that completely, you know, uh, say, "Wow, well, that that is what makes the flavor for this setting." And I think it's probably important from a game master standpoint that you actually go through the edges and you look at which ones you think make sense that the setting designer has put in. That you're saying, "Well, that doesn't really make sense," or these make the ones from the core rules make a lot more sense um, or even something in the core rules doesn't make sense in this. You know, somebody might want to pick it and it doesn't make sense. Now, you can do that on the fly as the character players are talking about their character concepts and stuff like that. But I think it's a good thing to do is to say, OK, this setting's got 15 new edges. What are those 15 edges? Oh, one of them is about somebody in a cyberpunk world who's technology technologically illiterate. If that's not the flavor of game you're going for, um, you may want to take that off the table right at the beginning instead of have a player come and say, oh, I want that hindrance um, or I want this other edge. And you're saying, oh, gee, that just wasn't fitting what I wanted to do. You may want to take them off the table to start with, though adult conversations with your players during character creation is always an important thing. Should I put like a little more, you know, symbol or something? Because that's important. Um, another thing that now is the meat, right? So now you're getting into the setting meat. The part of the setting um, where we talk about setting rules and how they apply to the setting lore, right? So look at the setting rules and I decide which ones make sense. I, I really do do this because sometimes the setting rules that the setting designer puts in place maybe doesn't make sense to me. Um, like for example, uh, they may say, hey, this game is gritty. We don't do wound camps. And I may go, well, my game is gritty, but it's not that kind of gritty. So I do want wound camps. Or they may have something related to how hacking works in their world because it's cyberpunk and the hacking works this way. I may look at that and go, wow, that's complicated. Or they have two versions of it. There's the easy hacking and the hard hacking. Well, I like the easy hacking, but you know what? I'm going to tweak it this way. Good stuff to think about up front as you're looking at those setting rules that the that the settings bringing in place and anything that doesn't drive the flavor you're trying to get jettison or anything that really is just just oozes um you know the 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 genre keep it make sure that the players know it's there and use it like um monster hunters club that setting all the setting rules just ooze 80s kids on bikes you know, uh, solving weird mysteries in the world. They're all so good at that. You want to make sure that you don't, you don't take any of that out. And then maybe you steer the players towards it because you've read it, you understand it and you go, wow, that's really adding, adding to the flavor. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but it really bears repeating multiple times. Go through the lore, read it with a fine tooth comb, You've read, the, you read it once, you kind of get the gist of it, but now really read, think about how the NPCs are linked, 
think about how the history and what's coming is linked. Look at the plot point campaign because a lot of plot point campaigns are taking the, the setting. It feels like it was written. The, the lore of the setting was written so that it could lead into this plot point campaign. And then the plot point campaign does some world changing stuff. And on the outside, when you come out of it, the world is in an equilibrium that is no longer fun to adventure in, or it would be probably the place you'd want to adventure in. <laughs> and all that stuff that happened in the plot point campaign just got you there. And boy, it wouldn't have been better to fast forward through it. Really understand the history and the lore of the setting and start pulling stuff out that's too specific and makes it too hard for you to do what you want to do. I'll use Deadlands Lost Colony again. Made the mistake of just kind of using all the lore um, and not really curating it. And then the players latched onto it and they go, oh, we know this has happened and this has happened. And so I said, what do I need to do to kind of break free of that, that corner I've painted myself into? And so one of the things you can do is, uh, first off, throw out some of the you know core core things or don't use them. Um, so my for example, in Deadlands Lost Colony, there's a lot of cities or towns, really they're towns. They don't really have big cities, but there's a number of towns that exist that are in the atlas. They're described, um, have a lot of details. But then the players starting there, all that lore would have been, I would have had all the buildings defined and I'd have to have all the personalities and because you know they're from this city that's relatively big comparably speaking, now I have to have everything defined. Instead of doing that, I put them in their own small town, not on the map, um, called Greywater, out on the fringes, but they're there for a reason because they're, you know, one of them was tied to a caravan that was bringing supplies. The others found an old wrecked vehicle from the war that they were trying to fix, but that became kind of their start of their home base. That was the lore they understood. They weren't from these other towns. So when they came to those towns, I could build out the buildings and the establishments and the people. I did not have to um, worry about that up front. Um, and honestly, in some in some settings like Interface Zero, um, it has a Chicago section, which is so rich and so cool, and I love it. And I spent a lot of time in Chicago. So I pulled out a lot of the corporation that they used, like weird corporation names that they're using, obviously because... Um, you know, copyrights in the future. And I went and I said, no, 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 we're going to pick companies that kind of exist. And then we're going to extend what did they look like as they get there. And I, I just it reminds me all the time of like in um, Aliens, right? What a wonderful world building science fiction. And then when she gets into that loader, it's on the side of it is a Caterpillar logo. So you're like, wow, C Caterpillar is probably an own subsidiary of, you know, the, this corporation, but it's there. And I wanted that feeling. And I couldn't have done that if I would have just turned over the catalog to the to the characters and threw everything on there because they would have looked at it. And now they'd been saying, oh, where's this company? I, I want to go visit this company. And it's like, no, those aren't the companies I want to deal with. So I had to jettison that before we ever started and before they looked at the lore. So. Another thing, understand what you're trying to accomplish, jettison items that you want to bring your own creativity in, um, and that, and, and leave what keeps the flavor, leaves what makes the setting interesting to you. Um, and then finally, the atlas, right? Um, the maps, where things are. I always screw up really trying to understand how long it's going to take to get from place to place. And then when the players go, you know, something happened over here, it's like, oh, yeah, by horseback, they could get there in, like, hours. Oh, okay, well, that's not good because, you know, the expectation is it'll take them a while to get there and all these events will happen. Understand the map, um, you know, and and if you have to make it more, um, I don't know, more abstract, you can do that. But players don't, I don't think players like abstract. Uh, <laughs> they want to know how long it's going to take me to get from point A to point B. And that was one of the things in the setting, The Holler, which it has this very stylized map, which is very, very cool, very artistic. But I could just see my players going, well, how far is it between this spot and that spot? Because I want to know how long it takes me to walk there on foot versus if I find something, you know, do I need to have a horse? Um, and my players like to have a home base of operations. So the first thing they want to do is, 
you know, figure out if they can have, oh, I can get a train, I can get a wagon train going and that my base of operation, or I can fix a vehicle and turn it into my base of operation. They always want to have a base. So learning, understanding the map and how far things are always, always super important to be able to on the fly um, run with what they're doing. So that's kind of what I do. Um, did I do a good job in Deadlands? Nah, not so much. Do I do a better job? Um, as I'm looking at other settings um, that I'm stealing from, the flavor and the things and bringing them to my homebrew, I think, yeah, I'm doing better. Um, and so, yeah, I learned my lesson. We'll do better. Um, so read it once, understand it, make sure that you know what history and stuff that you really think is important that really drives it. And that's the stuff you're going to give to the players. Um, understand the atlas. Maybe jettison details and bring in your own details so it's fresh and the players can't, um, you know, just know that this thing happened. Oh, you, this company exists and I know this company does this. Therefore, this must be the bad guys. Well, no, because that company doesn't exist. And there's a bunch of other companies they've never heard of. So and then the last thing. Which I think was the second thing to talk about was the character side of it, the concept, understand the edges, jettison those that maybe aren't what you want upfront, um, pick the ones that have the flavor that you really want, um, take the setting rules that have flavor, those that are just kind of bolted on or they're not what you think makes sense, throw them out. Hopefully the players will have a good time. And you don't have to worry about if you want to run a plot point campaign, you can keep as much lore as you want. Not saying to get rid of that, but um, I also talked, had a video about doing a plot point campaign. And a lot of that was also about jettisoning NPCs and trying to bring the player's NPC, uh, player's um, background into it by turning those NPCs around or doing. So yeah, you should watch that video too, because I run plot points, I don't know, different, but it's just the way I run them. So anyway, this is Carl with Tabletop Tango. Look at the bubbles, do the stuff, uh, support us would be great so we can buy more Savage World stuff like settings. And um, check out Mastering the RPG podcast, wherever you're fine podcasters are sold. I don't know how the podcaster guys say that. So we'll catch you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye. It's a savage world. Strange as a weird world. It's a savage world. Bosses to explore. It's a savage world.